right, so we're recording now. We're recording now. We're recording now. Okay. Okay, so um, it's November. Uh, today is November 4th. It's 1024, and the interview is taking place in Corona, California. Is that it? Okay, so um, the interviewer is Selena Guan, and I'll be interviewing um, John Bosma. Yes. Okay. So, um, where and when were you born? I was born in Rancho, Montana. Uh, when at that time the area of Montana, north of the Yellowstone River, about seventy miles east of Billings, there were a lot of people lived there, and this. Uh, one of the farmhouses was a post office and they gave it the name Rancher Montana and that's what my birth certificate said because that was an official U.S. post office. Later as people left the, the area the post office faded away and it was no longer in, in active use. So that's what my birth certificate says, Rancher Montana. You won't find it anywhere on the map because there's nothing there but bare <laughs> land. That's very cool. Okay, so who were your parents and um, what, what did your parents do for a living? What did your parents do for a living? I don't understand you, man. Oh, um, who were your parents and um, where, what did your parents do for an occupation? Well, my mother was a housewife, like all the women were in that era, because of being on the farm, you took care of the, the chickens, you did the cooking. There were three full meals every day, a big breakfast, a big uh, d dinner, and then the, at noontime, and then supper, because people worked, there was hard work on the farm. So my mother was uh, the housewife, and my dad, was, he farmed initially, and later on he quit the farming and he went to work as foreman for a construction company because the, the drought came along and there was, nothing would grow. The grass would grow maybe t two inches high. <laughs> so it was like when they had the dust bowl through Oklahoma, they had the drought in Montana in a lot of the western states. Mm -hmm. okay. So did you have any siblings? Yes. I had two brothers and three sisters. Oh, wow. And at present, I only, I'm the only surviving male, and I have one sister in Billings, Montana, and she's in a care facility, not in good condition. Glad to hear that. Um, did any of them serve in the military? Did any of them serve in the military? Well, my my brother served in the, in the army. In after World War II, he was in the occupation forces in in Europe. And my parents both came from Germany, so he saw a lot of our relatives in Germany. I never did meet any of them because I was in the Pacific all the time. Okay. Um, so what were you doing before you entered the service? I, wor I would work on farms for $2 a day, room and board. Irrigating sugar beets, stacking hay, things like that. That was the standard pay rate and a lot of the men di didn't like it. Here I was, 15, 16 years old, getting $2 a day like the men do. But I worked for an old Swede. He says, you do a man's pay, you, a, day, a man's work, you get a man's pay. And he paid me $2 a day like he did the other men. And I could outwork any of them, so. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So um, we're going to move on to your military service. So, um, so you said you serve in the Navy, right? Yes. The Navy. Um, were you enlisted or were you drafted? Uh, no, I enlisted in November 1935 at Salt Lake City, Utah. Went through tra basic training at San Diego, 
and rode the USS Henderson, uh, one of the two Navy transports. This was AP-1 from, Ham from uh, San Diego through the Panama Canal to Hampton Roads, Virginia, where I went to machinist made school for about six month period. And then I was assigned to the USS Medusa, a big repair ship that was based in San Pedro, California. So in September 1936, I went on board the USS Medusa, AR-1, ended up in the main, in the big machine shop. There were 55 men worked in that machine shop. And the Medusa was the first ship built as a repair ship, so it was AR number one. And with battleships or cruisers, would come alongside for two weeks at a time. We would do repair work on them. And we had a big foundry. They could make all, all sorts of castings. It was a pipe shop, ship fitter shop. They even had a plating shop. They could plate gold, silver, optical shop, because it was range finders in the Navy at that time, a lot of optics. So the watch and clock repair shop, just about everything you had except dry docking a ship. Wow. Um, so why did you choose the Navy? Why did you choose to serve in the Navy? Well, I wanted to go in the Army Air Corps, and my mother said she wouldn't have anything to do with the Army. <laughs> and my dad had been in the German Navy, and so she said, go into the Navy, so I, that's what I did. Cool. Um, so during basic training, do you remember anything about your basic training? So when you first enlisted? I hated it. <laughs> Do you have any good stories to tell? Have what? Do you have any good stories to tell about basic training? No, not really. <laughs> it was a lot of hard work. You get it, and I could see where it was necessary because they, they have to break you in to fit the mold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do Do you remember any of your instructors? Well, it was a chief. I don't know what. What, what, whether he was a boatswain mate or what, name of Richardson, he was harsh, but he was fair. Oh, okay. Um, so did you receive any specialized training? Any what? Specialized training? No. No? Okay. And how did you adapt to military life? So the physical stuff, the barracks, the food, the social life? Well, the, the food was okay, and I think at that age, mo most young men adapt fairly readily. I did. I wasn't a renegade. Some of them would, would go a AWOL and things like this, but I didn't have that in me to do that. Okay. So you said you uh, served in the Pacific, right? Pac yes. Pacific, Pacific on the repair ship? On the, you served on a repair ship, correct? Yes, on the Medusa. Okay, so um, do you have any good stories about your service time? No, not really. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it was it was a, a a good ship, and the chief was a Italian heritage, Pancho Salvador Trillo. He was a harsh taskmaster. All right. Um, what kinds of friendships and relationships did you, friendships and relationships, uh, what kind of friendships and relationships did you develop? In well, I, I had a, lot, a number of good buddies, but they, I, I don't have any, anyone that has survived me. They passed away years ago, everyone I ever knew. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, did you stay in touch with your uh, Did you stay in touch with your friends after you left the service? Did you Did you stay in touch with your friends after you left the service? 
I did with a few of them, and then eventually they passed away. So they reached the stage where there was no one to be to contact anymore. Um. So while you were serving, how did you stay in touch with your family? Did you write them letters or? Well, in World War II, they had the emails. <laughs> Or it wasn't called email, it was called something else. I forget what it was called now. You, you, you'd write it out and they would send it and then it was tra copied on the other end and mailed to them. Telegraph? V I think it was V-mail. 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 V-mail, I think is what it was called. Pretty cool. I'm not certain of that though. Okay. Um, so where were you? So you served, did you serve until the end of World War II? So when did you uh, leave the service? When did I leave the service? Yes. In September 1946. I was tired and worn out. And uh, I would go to bed at night and the sheets would be wet. And it took me three or four years to get over that. And then my next door neighbor, and we were living in Napa. He was in the Naval Reserve down in Vallejo. He talked me into joining the reserve, so I did. And I was recalled for Korea. And the first ship I went to was the USS Difte, AKA 59, that I had served on before. I put it in commission. I was on the pre-commissioning detail in 1944. So I, I served on it twice during World War II and then again for Korea. Okay. Um, did you do the same things in Korea as World War II? Well, no. In, in World War II on the Medusa, I was in the big machine shop and I ended up in charge, I was chief machinist mate, in charge of the machine shop. I could run any of the machine tools on the DIFTA. I was part of the engineering department and I stood watches in the engine room. I was one of the engineering watch officers. And during Korea when I was recalled to the DIFTA, I ended up, I was chief engineer of the ship and also stood off to the deck watches underway because they didn't have enough qualified officers of the decks. And one time off Korea, we rearmed ships for 72 hours, day and night. So I was the officer of the deck on the bridge for 72 hours. The only time I was relieved was to go down to the head, to the restroom. The rest of the time they'd bring me up coffee and sandwiches, so I kept the ship on even course and keel during all the operations. And when you rearm another ship, you go, you're, you're about 10 to 15 feet away from that ship, and you have to maintain the course and speed because you're transferring stuff out of five holes. And if you start zigzagging or getting um, not being in sync with that other ship, you could snap cables and kill or injure people. So the first time I stood off to the deck watch when it was over with, the chief warrant boatswain was, came in the wardroom and he said, who was the officer of the deck? I said, I was. He said, I thought so. He said, that's the best job of station keeping since I've been on this ship, which was quite a, you know, good comment, so. But it was easy to do. I knew everything that went on down in that engine room, so it made it for me. It made it easy. It's very cool. Um, let's see. So where were you when the war ended? So when World War Two ended, where were you? I was in San Francisco at the time between ships. Um. What did you do after the war? After the war, I worked for the Maritime Commission in Susun Bay on 
the re reserve fleet, the old ships laid up for a while. I started a machine shop from scratch, scratch in Napa, California. And then when I was called back in 1950 for the Navy, I closed everything down. And that, after I was released from duty in January of 54, I went to work for General Electric for about six or eight months, and then I went to work for Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park. I w stayed there 26 years and retired from there. Wow. Um, so when you returned home, how were you received by your family and your friends? No one seemed to pay any attention to you. How, how is that? They didn't. It was just like you, 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 you had never been gone. So was it difficult to readjust to civilian life? Not, not for me. Being in the military, you, you, you move around from this place to that, so you, you have to adjust and adapt. So, I was, I could adapt very easily. Some people couldn't, but I could. Are you a member? Are you a member of any veterans organizations? The only one I belong to uh, is Pearl Harbor Survivors, and they don't have any branches anymore. It's practically faded away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, how did your wartime experiences affect your life? So, how did your wartime experiences? Ex um, affect your life? Well, I, uh, personally, I don't think it had that much of an effect on it. That's my opinion. Okay. Um, did, so, did you learn any big lessons from it? Did you learn any big lessons from your time in the service? Well, I learned a lot about engineering departments on board ship and standing off the deck watches underway, so I knew what I was capable of. You, you get so after a while, you, you fall in the groove. You, get, you got a good understanding of what goes on. You know what the boilers will do, what the main engine will do, and. Um, so has your military service impacted your views on war? No, what was that again? So has your military service impacted your views on war, or the military in general? I still don't understand it, uh, man. Okay. So, so, this one. But How has the military service impacted your feelings on war in the military? Well, I think sometimes war is, ne is necessary, like the attack on Pearl Harbor. Had, we had to go to war, but sometimes I think some of these wars could be, could be evaded. I, I was standing in Rome one time, looking around, and I wondered what the world would be like today if we never had wars to, to ruin a lot of things. And I stood on the, the steps of the cathedral in Cologne, Germany, and in World War II, just before we went to Germany, in the Naval Institute it, proceedings, the magazine, it showed pictures of Cologne, and the cathedral was the only thing left standing. The Allies bombed that city to nothing, but they left the cathedral standing, and you could see park marks in the granite and marble and on the outside surfaces of the building were where bombs had probably be burst fairly close by but the allies left that cathedral standing which i thought was was very interesting okay um so do you think world war 2 could have been avoided 
Do you think World War II could have been avoided? Uh, from what I have read, if, if Chamberlain, and I forget who the French general was that running France, if they had done things a little different, it could have been. But whether Hitler could have been stopped w without the war, I, w one will never know. So, for the future generations that will be seeing this interview, do you have any messages that you want to pass on? Well, I, I would tell the kids when I go to the schools and talk to them, stay in school, get all the education you can because you're going to need it. And that's more true today than it's ever been. And with all the artificial intelligence and things being automated out there, there are fewer jobs all the time, you, so you have to be very technical savvy to, to be aware of what is going on and, and keep up with things in today's world. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to talk about? Well, I guess not really. There was a lot of censorship in World War II. They, they, they censored all our outgoing mail. And the ship I was on, they even censored the ingoing mail, which I thought was a violation of privacy because I had buddies on other ships and the mail was not censored, but that's what the command on that ship did. And so I think that in, in a lot of ways, the, the, the poor enlisted man, and I have been both enlisted and, and commissioned, had very few rights sometimes. It changed a lot. When I was called back for for the Korean War, the Uniform the Co the Code of Military Justice had come in in 1948. When the Air Force w came in as a separate unit, they had the U UCMJ, and so all services adopted that. So when I got on board ship, I, w I had gone through school at Treasure Island for the, for that UCMJ, so I knew what was in the, in the stream, and the exec and the captain were violating more of the crew's civil rights than they could shake a stick at. And so some, some of the my men were complaining. <clears throat> so I went to the first-class yeoman, who was the head yeoman, and I said, tell the men to put in a request to see the legal office over, over in the service ship, and they did, and pretty soon the exec and the commanding officer changed their method of doing things. So a roundabout way, I, I made some changes. Okay. So um, for people that are going to jo join the service in the future, do you have any advice for them? Advice for people who are going to join the military? Well, I, 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 never, I, have, I have never tried to push anyone into joining the military. And I, each year for about the last 10 or 12 years, I've talked to the young people that are juniors in high school. And most of them, there was only one I ever ran across that talked about wanting to be in the military. Most of them were were not interested. They seem to have a negative uh, opinion of the military. Are you thinking about joining? Yeah. So um, we're Air Force. So we're we are both um, thinking about joining the Air Force. So we are both um, thinking about joining the Air Force. 
Well, I think the Air Force is the upcoming thing. And I, I think the time will come when they won't be manned aircraft. It's going to be all automated setup. You won't you won't be sitting behind the wheel of that plane, juggling the controls. Mm -hmm. It it's it's coming. You know, the whole world is heading towards it. You know they they have automobiles now that they can program to drive down the street and come off at a certain intersection and do certain things. So, and the technology is there and it's going to change even faster in the next five years. Those old duffers like myself are going to be antiquated. We won't know what's going on. And a lot of the young people today are not interested in a military career. I ran across of all the kids he interviewed, one of them, he was very skinny. Did you want something? No, I just wondered when this was going to end. Oh. He, he, he wanted to be a Navy SEAL. But I didn't figure he would make it past basic training. Of course, he, he might have. He, he was so skinny, I didn't think he, and he could survive that hazardous training that they give him. It takes a good person to do that. Yes. Um, why do you think youth have a negative view of the military? Why do I what? Why do the youth, so young people, why do they have a negative view of the military? I don't think they want to be regimented. Okay. It takes a certain type of personality. You, a lot of people can adapt, but some of them can't. So, do you think the military has changed, and how how have how has the military changed, in your opinion? You say, do, do I think America has changed? The military. Oh, the military. Yes. Yes, I I I, I think that the servicemen have more freedom than they did initially when I went in the Navy. The the rules and regulations in the, in 35 were very harsh and the uniform co uniform code of military justice made it more more easy for people to adapt it wasn't as stringent the code as what had been previously which i think was a good thing so you think it's better for to for the codes to be more strict yes So, if you were to go back in time and change something about your life, what would you have changed? Well, one of the things I would have done, I was, in 1946, I was pre-registered to go to Cal in Berkeley. I would have done that. I would have gone to Cal. I was talked out of it, but I, that was one thing. Of, I would have changed. Okay. 
So when it comes to the military, do you think education is important? Do you think education is important in the military? Yes, very important. There are many opportunities for getting advanced education in the military if the people want to put the time and effort into using them. Okay, that, that concludes our questions. That concludes this interview. Okay, thank right. you. Thank you so much.